worked on several other such procedures before um, units for the ships and for editor ships. Uh, but this one I ended up writing right the silver. So of course I spent about two and a half years writing the thing. It has never paid for itself. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that actually kind of strikes me as uh, one of what I mentioned before was was being a devourer of uh, of content, mm -hmm. right? So it, it, it strikes me that uh, you seem to be a person who does devour that content, be films, uh, mm -hmm. because you to, to even attempt to even think that you could write an encyclopedia, you need to be able to uh, go through all of that content. Mm -hmm. um, as an author, uh, it, is it important to be a devourer of, of things around you? Um, it is for me, certainly. Um, you know, I, you know, the sort of one area which I don't really watch very much is, is actually television. Um, you know, I will watch movies on television. Occasionally, I will watch um, series like that, that tremendous um, Belgian crime series that PBS were doing until a few weeks ago. Uh, Professor T was on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, occasionally I'll watch a series like that. But most of the time, I you know, if I want to watch it, it's, it's movies or possibly news that I, I select. And as far as books go, I mean, you know, I no longer have a library card in these modern times, but I mean, you, you, you are fairly well aware that I use this library for extensively. For yes. And basically <coughs> about one in three books that I consume comes from here in the early two or three books that I've turned. That was not a way for me to finish mm -hmm. a compliment. Just so you know. <laughs> but yes, he comes to the library often. Um, so, okay, the, the, uh, one of the things that we talked about in our conversation also was, uh, and perhaps this is just my lay person's um, lack of knowledge, but we, we talked a lot about the self-publishing world and the traditional publishing world. Mm -hmm. And then as, as, as I thought about our conversation afterwards, I, I, thought, I wondered whether there were a lot more similarities than, you know, the, the self-publishing world was supposed to be a revolution mm -hmm. that was supposed to upend everything, but it struck me that there's still a lot um, that's similar, just maybe perhaps the, the method of distribution has changed, but we talked a lot about uh, the responsibilities, even you as, as an artist that has been published numerous times over your career, about how you still have to go out and sell your book, how you still have to sell yourself, uh, how you still, there's promotion involved. It strikes me as very similar to what everyone who's self-published has to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, when, when I first started um, publishing back in, back in the 80s, <coughs> I mean, e even quite small publishing houses, um, you know, would send you out on, on an interview tour if you got a new book that came out, um, which, which I, I always found was great fun, you know, I'd sort of go to all these funny little local radio or TV stations, and, you know, sort of burble self-indulgently <laughs> until they told me to shut up and then I'd go on to the next one. Um, and it's, it's quite good discipline because I, I think the most I did was about eight or nine broadcasts and a single day of different radio stations um, scattered around Birmingham, I think it was. But um, no, nowadays there's none of that. Um, the the uh, publicity that the publishers offer is minimal um, and sometimes even counterproductive because you know, they, they can be so inexpert at it. Um, and as you say, and you know, a lot of self-published authors point out that they're, you know, they're those commercially published authors are having to do everything as much publicity work as they are. And of course getting less money per copy of the book sold because most of the money is being made by the publisher. No, the, the other thing we were talking about in terms of self-publishing is not so much the revolution because um, you know self-publishing or vanity publishing, as, as they're called, used to be a very expensive exercise, and nowadays it's a whole lot cheaper and it's a whole lot easier. Um, you know, so, so you know a lot more people are tempted into self-publishing, but of course, to, to sort of old hacks like me, self-publishing is, is one of those things that you never ever did for the first 30 years of my career, or 20 to odd years, you know, self-publishing was not done on, whereas of course in fact there are now really some quite good books that are self-publishing. Have you self-published? No. I'm not yet? I'm, I'm very tempted. A lot of authors are doing it to keep their backlist in print. And, um, you know, 
I think there may be someone in the crowd that would like to do that. You do self-publish on the web, the extension of the film noir. I call oh. that self-publish. Well, well, that's a good point, though. I mean, you could say that uh, the internet being what it is, that's, that is self-publishing, right? If you are. Yes, I, I, I've got a huge, a well, it's now a pretty huge website called Noirish, which um, I describe as the extension to, to that encyclopedia, although it's really rather different. I write about the books as well as movies on it. So now we, we um, as as you mentioned, that we we've talked about the fact that you do fiction writing and you do non-fiction writing. Mm -hmm. We talked about the different types of writing: the short stories. Um, you haven't done a memoir yet, have you? No, I haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, my memory is too lousy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I've probably been sued by various parties. <laughs> <laughs> really? Good to know. Good stories in there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Plus, my daughter. <laughs> well, that, that's the only way she'll know her real dad, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, there's, a, we, ha we, we talked about uh, what the different types of discipline that comes in if you're doing different types of writing, or maybe not necessarily discipline, but different uh, methods or forms that you use when you start writing, uh, depending on the medium or, or perhaps the genre that you're writing in. Um, do you have a, a, kind of, what's your, do you prefer one or the other? Do you prefer to do works like these, the non-fiction works, or fiction? Do you? Um, I, I certainly normally would prefer fiction because it's, it's an awful lot easier. Um, you know, non-fiction, you know, at least some vestigial part of your wants to make sure that it's actually true what you're writing down. Um, whereas in fiction, you can, you can just indulge yourself entirely. You know, let, let, let the whim take you where it is. Not, not always, of course. I mean, you know, some, sometimes you're writing fiction for a particular purpose or a particular market. Um, but then, I mean, my fiction, even that is really difficult because, you know, I sort of start off writing something that's science fiction and then it ends up being a bit noirish. And, you know, then it turns into fantasy and art and while I realize it isn't science fiction in the first place at all. <coughs> So you're, you're one of the only people I've ever heard who would say that the, the idea of world building in terms of fiction doesn't intimidate them. They, they find that easier than... Oh, yeah. Because you just make it up as you go along. <laughs> so, <laughs> enough. so it's not planned out. It's not, you don't, you don't kind of have a... Um, I, 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 I do to, to a, a fairly great extent, to be honest. I, I've got a pretty good idea of you know, what, what the world is. But yeah, I mean, you know, one of the great advantages, certainly if I'm writing sort of speculative fiction of any kind, uh, you know, so as if you can to a great extent, make it up as you go along. And then, of course, you've got to make the new things consistent with the old ones. So have you ever painted yourself into a corner and said, I can't figure out how to make this work? Um, well, luckily, I started a sort of still very small series of tales quite a few years ago. Um, which was set in New Amsterdam, which of course you realize is what New York is to be. Um, and they're very much influenced by Edmund Bain's 87th Precinct novels. So <laughs> interesting. Um, but, but, you know, it's sort of in the New Amsterdam stories with 14th Precinct Precinct. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the, the, the cops there, with the cases that they have, I mean, are deliberately like, break the rules. One of the things about New Amsterdam is that you can never be quite certain that it's going to still be the same when you turn the corner, this, this kind of thing. Um, and the plots of sort of those tales tend to break the rules. Interesting. My, my wife says they, they can be really madly because you know, quite often the cops don't solve the case. Um, you're we're not supposed to let them know they can't read them the way through. No. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, oh, so now they now they have to go. Okay, which is this one where this case is solved or not? Mm. Interesting. Well, they said they're they're only what, um, 